Another common uh, archetype that you will see is that there is a balancing process, but it has delays. Okay. Um, the common example is, uh, let's say you go into a, a new hotel, you get into the bathtub, you want to have a bath, so you turn on the faucet. But of course, we all know that uh, when you turn on the faucet, you don't get hot water immediately. So as you're not getting hot water, you keep on turning the faucet on even more, even more, even more. And then suddenly you get hurt. You get hit with a blast of extremely hot water because you've turned the faucet on too much to the hot position. right? So that is happening because there's a delay in the response of a system. So many times uh, this plays out even in, in the field of economics and, and in, in social systems where you say, well, I've got a problem. I'm trying to solve the problem by applying the corrective solution to the problem. But of course, when you apply corrective solution to a problem, it takes time for the effect of your solution to kick in, right? So having applied some corrective solution, corrective efforts to the problem, wait a little bit for the efforts to take effect before you start pushing in even more corrective actions. If you're impatient and you keep on doing more and more of the corrective action, then you might have overshot the limit and that might cause other kinds of problems. Okay. Now, this happens a lot in the real estate business. right? So, whenever there are delays, you can potentially expect this kind of a scenario. So, in the real estate business, what happens is, let's say that there's a lot of demand for housing. And of course, once there's a lot of demand for housing, builders start acquiring new land, developing the land, getting the permits to build on the land, building the infrastructure, and then constructing new homes, which they will sell to, to buyers, right? But this process takes a lot of time. Acquiring new land, getting the permits and so on can take years, right? So that's the delay, that even though there's demand, if they could come up with homes immediately, then of course they could sell those homes and make profits because they understand there's an immediate demand, but they can't do that, right? And while this delay is going on, lots of other developers are also doing the same thing in trying to respond to this demand for homes. So what happens is that invisibly, you think there's a demand and a lot of people have developed uh, because of the delay in being able to construct new developments, there becomes a situation where there's overinvestment, right? Because let's say you are a builder, you start get this new development, you start constructing. Another builder is also doing the same thing. They, they, they're starting the process of acquiring new land and so on and so forth, right? So, and you still see that as you're going through these process of building these homes and so on, there's still a lot of demand because all of these things are projects which are just going on. The, the homes have not yet been constructed. So there are still people out there looking for homes. They haven't bought homes, right? So you think there's still more demand and you continue to develop not only the properties you already acquired, you continue to look for more areas where you can buy land and develop. And as a result, when suddenly when all of these homes become available, you will realize that you've overinvested and there's not that much demand to, to buy all these homes, right? And then you have a big slump because there's an oversupply and suddenly all the demand has been fulfilled. There's an oversupply. There's a glut of homes on the market and the price just collapses. Okay. And then of course, people don't get into the real estate uh, development area at all for decades. And then suddenly you see that there's a shortage of houses and then this whole process begins again. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why we observe business cycles, right? That there are so many new processes. There are so many things where you, when you try to create new capacity, when you try to build new factories and so on, there's a delay in the process. And while there's a delay, what really happens is we don't have an accurate measurement of the actual demand and we end up overshooting the demand which causes a glut and collapses the market and then the process begins again. So this is really the source of business cycles that people see in economics and this is also an archetype that we see commonly. Okay, So example is real estate. So the, the managerial implication of this is in a sluggish system by that we mean in a system where you are not able to see the response to an action immediately, it takes time for something to, to respond. Aggressiveness produces instability. 
right? In a sluggish system, you shouldn't be too aggressive. So, for example, suppose you have a headache. You take a pill and, you know, you wait for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, nothing has happened and you're still having your headache. You take another pill, right? 15 minutes later, your headache is still not subsided. You take a third pill, right? Now, what happens is that the first pill was probably already acting and if you had given it a half an hour, it might have solved the problem. It might have reduced your headache. But what now has happened is that by being aggressive, you've taken a lot of headache pills and that you might have, at this point, you might be in an overdose situation. You might run into a lot of other problems, right? So in a sluggish system, wait for your actions to take effect and then if necessary, take further action, okay? Otherwise, being excessively aggressive produces lots of other problems. Okay, so that's the situation with, uh, the, with the archetype of balancing process with a delay. Okay, now shifting the burden to the intervener is just like the shifting the burden archetype, except that uh, in the shifting the burden to the in intervener, we are explicitly looking at the quick fix being an external intervention. Okay, which is relying on some outside people to solve the problem, whereas the fundamental solution is to develop your own internal capabilities. Right? So this is just another example of the shifting the burden archetype. Okay? In general, the shifting the burden archetype does not always talk about the quick fix being an external intervention. The quick fix may be just you know, taking a pill or uh, you know, not maintaining your machines and things like that, that is a quick fix. So it's not necessarily an external thing. Whereas when you have the shifting the burden archetype and the quick fix involves an external entity, then you say it is shifting the burden to the intervener. Okay. So the idea here is teach people to fish rather than giving them fish. That's the managerial solution. Right. So don't just give them fish, don't just give them the solution or you know, hire an external person to do it. Instead, develop their own abilities to solve their problems. Okay. This is another common archetype, eroding goals, which is you set a goal to say, well, let's say we want to achieve a sales of 20 million next year. And the actual sales come in at 16 million. Right. Then for the following year, you have a uh, you have two ways of dealing with the situation. One is to say, well, we didn't meet our goals, so let's work harder, let's solve the problem, let's do fundamental changes in the organization so that we are able to meet this goal of 20 million. That's one way to meet your goals. Another way to meet your goal is to simply adjust the goal downwards and say, well, you know what, for the following year, our sales goal is going to be 18 million and we meet it, right? So you can meet the goal either by working harder or by reducing the goal. Eroding goals is when people reduce the goals in order to meet the goal rather than actions, taking fundamental actions that will help, that will enable you to meet the original goals. We do this all the time. Uh, so there's no need to give great amount of examples, but you see also companies and economic systems doing exactly the same thing. Okay. So you may have GPA goals. You're not meeting them. You work either work harder. Or you say, well, it's okay. I thought I, I want a GP of 3.5. I'll be happy with 3.3. Okay. Or a company says, uh, we want to have promised a delivery time of uh, three days. They're not able to meet it. And then say, okay, subsequently from this point onwards, we, our delivery time is five days. Okay. So the managerial uh, solution here, of course, is hold the vision. There was a reason why you set your original goals at whatever level you'd set them. There must have been a rationale. So hold that vision, work harder and try to meet the vision. Okay. So here's the, you know, budget deficit scenario. You have a pressure to reduce the deficit. You can take actions to reduce the deficit or you can simply reduce the goal of how much you want to reduce the deficit. Okay. So that's a common archetype as well, which is eroding goals. Here we are looking at an archetype which is escalation and this always happens in competitive situations. The great example of escalation of course is the arms race. You know they have nukes, we build nukes, they build more nukes, we build even more nukes and so on and so forth. And 
uh, what is going on here is when you have got a competitive situation if you have results of a relative to b those lead to actions by a which lead to a's results which affect the results of a relative to b so for example let us say that uh, uh, you've got uh, the number of nuclear weapons of us relative to russia this was not russia ussr back uh, in the time when the ussr had not uh, collapsed okay so here we say well uh, we both have equal number of nukes so let's say we go and build more nukes so now we are in a situation where we've got more nukes than they they say okay let's go and build more nukes than they have right so now they have restored parity now we say okay we want to get ahead and so on and so forth right so it keeps on escalating looking at it from a business perspective this could be simply two companies which are just ruthlessly cutting price and eventually what happens of course is that both companies go out of business okay so price wars that's a very important thing as well this is a common thing right so what you really want to do in these kinds of scenarios is look for win win situations rather than uh, you know just going all out for competition right or if you, if that is not possible look for scenarios where you can uh, you you can make you can do things without getting into this uh, this kind of a race this is also a very common archetype called success to the successful and what we are really saying is uh, take an example here let's say this a and b here are two departments in a particular company okay so now let's say that for whatever reason you say this year i'm going to give more money to uh, to department a right so you allocate money to department a and of course uh, department a uses the money thus well so now you say next year you say well uh, you know you didn't allocate money to department b so they didn't do all that well but next year you're saying i'm going to award the money based on the performance a performed better so i'm going to give money to a so a becomes even more successful and of course all along b is becoming less successful because b is not getting enough money and the more successful a becomes the less money b gets right so this is the successful success to the successful archetype this happens all the time and there are many many examples of this in business and in fact what really is happening is uh, this is the phenomenon by which uh, rich get richer that's what the phenomenon is right if you're rich you're able to offer a better education you can go to better colleges uh, you can have better resources you can study more in fact you can uh, you can go for you can afford to go for test preps and so on you get into better colleges and all of that and of course you get better jobs you get even richer okay so that's the rich to uh, rich get richer phenomenon uh, but there are telling examples of this even from from business right let's take a look at the competition that originally existed between apple and microsoft apple was the company that really made the first uh, uh, personal computers but then along came ibm and made personal computers right so apple actually had a lead in the market but ibm came along and uh, with microsoft's uh, operating systems that were part of ibm uh, what really happened was that ibm was able to far outstrip apple uh, to the point that at one uh, at one point people thought that apple was gone apple would have been bankrupt right what was actually happening is that although uh, ibm came later to the pc market uh, to the pc industry what they did was they made their complete architecture open right so ibm pcs although they were called ibm pcs could actually be made by any company because the specs were all completely open right so any company could make an ibm pc put a windows operating system on it and sell it or put a microsoft operating system on it and sell it right so obviously their prices were much lower there was a lot of competition and uh, because their volumes were higher uh, they you know they could even uh, price themselves much lower so it turned out that apple because it was closed uh, was more expensive right but there are other issues as well when uh, so the because of because they were cheaper ibm pc's market share started rising and because their market share started rising it became more attractive for people who were writing writing software for these co computers to focus solely on writing software for ibm pcs 
right? Because the market was much bigger and it was not in the interest of software, small software developers especially, to release two versions of every software product that they had. Uh, one version for IBM's and one version for, for Apple. So eventually what happened is uh, more software products started becoming available for IBM PCs, which made it even more attractive, which made their sales even higher, which made their prices drop even more, and which made it even more attractive for software developers to develop for the product. Eventually, this process almost wiped Apple out of the face of this market. Okay, So that's success to the successful. The more successful you become, the more attractive your product becomes in many other dimensions than just price. Right? In this example, we saw it as software. And in fact, not just software, uh, the same argument applies also to peripheral devices. People who make peripherals start making peripherals for your platform rather than for the other platform. Okay, The same uh, kind of argument, the same kind of phenomenon played out earlier in the videotape market. Originally, there were two uh, competing formats for videotapes. One was uh, VHS and the other was Betamax. In fact, VHS is the format that finally won, but in fact, Betamax was the, was the format that came first to the market. But exactly like in the Apple versus IBM PC scenario, Betamax was a proprietary format. Only one company made the players, only one company made the tapes. Okay, So even though they were the first players to the market, initially they came to the market, they sold the video cassette players, they sold the video tapes, and uh, studios, movie studios, produced their movies and made them available on uh, Betamax tapes for the public to buy. right? And initially this was the only game in town. Subsequently what happened was, VHS came as a competing format. VHS was a format that was an open format. It was created by a group of companies and they licensed out the technology to make uh, the video cassette players to many companies. As a result, there were many manufacturers available for, the, for video cassette players. Many brands were available in the market. The prices were lower and slowly the market share of, of the VCR format and the VCR players started creeping up. And it became more attractive for studios to make their movies available in, the, uh, in that format. So initially, studios were making their movies available in both formats. But the moment the uh, VHS format started becoming popular, several studios said, well, this is the more popular format. I'm going to make my movies only for this format and not make the movies available in the Betamax format. Okay, Just like in the computer case, we were talking about software vendors. Same thing here, movie studios. And eventually what happened was that Betamax got wiped off the consumer market altogether. Right? This kind of effort is what is called as the network effect. effect. Right? And the network effect essentially leads to a winner-take-all kind of a scenario, the rich gets richer scenario. Okay, So that's what it is. Uh, okay. And... Uh, success to the successful, once again, what you really want to do is uh, don't get stuck in this. You have to break or weaken the coupling between uh, these things. Tragedy of the commons is another important archetype. Tragedy of the commons archetype is when there's a common resource which several players use, but it's not owned by any one of them, and essentially it's the commons, so it's free. Okay which means that it's in the interest of each of the players to exploit the common resource to the fullest. Take the example of the fisheries off the New England coast. Now this, this, uh, this area of the ocean was rich with fish in the, uh, in the start of uh, the 2000, uh, 1900s century. And of course fisheries, all they had to do was take their boats, fish, and come and sell their fish. So this is the commons. Nobody owned the oceans and you were free to fish as much as, as, much as you liked in these oceans. right? Uh, but as people were on fishing in these waters, there was overfishing and uh, what was happening was that the fish population started actually reducing. right? So we were fishing the oceans in such a way 
that the ocean was not able to replenish the amount of fish that was taken out uh, as fast as the rate at which the fish was being taken out. Right? So the replenish replenishment rate of fish became lower than the rate at which it was being fished. And so the fish population kept on reducing. Now some may think, well, the ocean is pretty much infinite. It's not possible to overfish and take out all the fish in the ocean, but that's exactly what we have done with the result that today uh, the amount of fish in the ocean has become really less. We have reduced the uh, amount of fish by something like 95%. But what happened was as the fish population in the ocean was keeping on reducing, the companies, fisheries, were not saying, okay, let's scale back. Let's scale back our catch of fish so that the, we give time for the ocean to replenish the fish. No, instead what they started doing was as the size of the catch kept on reducing, they started using better and better technology to make their fishing more and more efficient, right? So they started using technology to locate where fish were and they started using trawlers to, you know, to use large nets and simply trawl the ocean and capture all kinds of creatures from the ocean and start uh, fishing in huge quantities, right? So as a result of all this, what has really happened is that uh, we've, killed off the potential, uh, the fishing potential in the oceans. Now, now the unfortunate part is that when it comes to commons, it is not in, in the interests of any of the players to actually hold back, right? If you were a fishery and uh, if you were a person uh, who was fishing in the ocean, you cannot say, well, I'll restrain myself, I'll not go and fish as much as I used to. Uh, let me give time for the ocean to build up the fish. No, because if you leave this, uh, if you reduce your activity, somebody else is going to go and take it because it's the commons, right? So that's the unfortunate problem. And this is what is called the tragedy of the commons. The same thing applies to environmental pollution as well. Uh, prior to the days when there were controls, it was in your interest to pollute as much as possible for your profit. If you don't, somebody else is going to do it. So you, you might as well do it, okay? That's the tragedy of commons problem. So here you see, uh, it is in the interest of each individual to keep on acting uh, as much as possible, okay? So A's activity gives more gain to A, so A increases the activity even more. Same thing with B. B's activity, they, they think of them as uh, the fishery, for example. So B's activity, uh, the more they do, the more they gain, right? But what happens is the total activity, as each actor is acting, the total activity increases and uh, the, the gain for both of them starts actually going down with the delay because of the resource limit, okay? So that's the problem. The net gains and net uh, gains for A and B uh, start reducing, right? So the gain per individual activity starts reducing because you have taken out the resource. Okay, the same. It, this can be applied in all kinds of situations. So the problem here is that unfortunately we have to manage the commons, right? So we have to say, well, we have to start uh, placing rules and regulations on how much of these activity can be performed. To what extent can you use the commons? Uh, you'll have to price people for using the commons and all of those things. So you can manage the commons. Uh, other solutions, of course, are uh, education. Educate people on, on this, you know, uh, put peer pressure, bring in regulation, all of those things. Those are all different ways by which you can manage the commons. Another archetype which we've already seen is fixes that fail. So you have a problem, you think you've got a fix for the problem, but there are unintended consequences uh, which don't really solve the problem. Uh, this was the example which we started with, with the dictator in, in Romania, but we've seen all other kinds of uh, examples as well of this. Another example is uh, you've got a company, it's producing, but of course, periodically you have to idle your plant to perform preventive maintenance on your, on your equipment. If you do that, of course, you're going to lose production time, you're going to lose profits. So the fix you may think for this is to say, well, I'm going to simply remove, not do preventive maintenance at all and keep on running my 
plant to the fullest. But then of course the consequence is that your plant is going to break down and you're going to have a much bigger problem on your hand. But why we keep on doing this is that this doesn't happen immediately. We keep on doing the bad thing and we get away with it for some time. So we think that we are off the hook. But eventually, of course, it's going to come and come and bite us. Okay. Or the other example that we spoke about earlier, borrowing to pay interest on loans. Right. So again, the problem here is, uh, the solution here is, uh, Use short-term fixes carefully, maintain your long-term focus. Uh, this is sort of analogous to shifting the burden. Okay, So this is another example you could say of shifting the burden. You're shifting the burden from uh, the short-term fix, uh, from the real solution to the short-term fix. Growth and underinvestment, this is also a common archetype. So uh, this is sort of limit, uh, related to limits to growth. But here the problem is the limit is self-imposed. So let's take a company that's growing a lot. You've got demand, uh, you keep growing. But what then happens is that uh, you don't build your capacity to manage the growth. Okay, uh, so that is growth and underinvestment. So while you're growing, you also have to keep investing on building your capacity to continue the growth. Okay, so this is sort of like saying, uh, remove the impediments to growth. The way you remove the impediments to growth is by investing. Okay, So uh, the, the impediments to growth might come in several forms. One is you might run out of production capacity. Second is you might run out of managerial capacity and so on. Okay, All of these are different impediments to growth. Uh, for example, you've got a company that's growing a lot, but while it's growing, you may also have to invest in customer service. If you don't, then eventually your customer service is going to become bad and you won't be able to grow anymore. So that could become the impediment to growth. So while you're growing, you also have to think about, well, what are the things that are going to come and bite me? What are the things that are going to uh, prevent me from growing any further? What are the consequences of growth that I need to manage? And you have to invest in those things. Of course, there's a good reason why companies don't invest in all of these things because they think, well, I'm growing now. How do I know if this growth is permanent? What if I make investments and my growth stops? Then all my investments are going to go away. So it's a real tricky balancing problem, but that's a challenge. Successful companies manage to play this game very well. Okay. So when there's demand, create capacity early. By capacity, we mean capacity for managing the process, whatever it is, whether it's production capacity, customer service capacity, R&D capacity, whatever it is. So that's our discussion of uh, archetypes. Uh, 